80 to 90% of our patients are dying. And that is pretty awful in the 21st century. We're going through the motions, we're doing all this stuff that we think is really clever, but it isn't working. Why isn't it working? Well, we've got some very, very clever and distinguished people all around the world looking at all the evidence and guiding us. ILCOR, all these other bodies, they produce guidelines. This is the UK Resuscitation Council in 2010. This is their ALS algorithm. This is the American Heart Association in 2020. It looks different, the graphics are different, the content is exactly the same. This is 2021, finally updated to 2023 UK Research Council. Different colors, different graphics, same message. Very little has changed other than a few considers at the bottom. So what's the problem? I mean, you know, if it's consistent, we're at least, we can at least say that, but our outcome figures are consistent as well. Because what we're actually delivering is vanilla average care. We've got the same resuscitation training for all of you as the most junior members of the team, of the least skilled members of the team. Why are we all doing the same? Why are we not doing something beyond ALS? Because this is best, at best average life support, ALS. The other thing about it is our patients aren't average either. Every single one of them is different. Every single one of them presents with a different condition. So why are we doing the same for all? We need a far more individualized approach. Not at the BLS level, because they're doing a great job at our level. We need to be targeting our management to every single one of these patients in whatever they particularly need. And that means looking into things more, monitoring them more, investigating them more, more gases, more analysis of what's actually going on in the physiology of this patient. Not just assuming it's H's and T's and just guessing that they happen to have hypokalemia or a thrombosis. What's, but the trouble for the research council is they've got to be careful. They've got a reputation. They've got to maintain safe standards. Sadly, that means they've got to maintain vanilla average. And we need much more than that, because we're standing on the edge of the void looking at 80 to 90% mortalities. How are we going to bridge that? Well, Anders and I talked about this a lot, and we think we've got it nailed. We think that we don't know where we got the idea from, but we think, you know what, I'm thinking hats, I'm thinking banners, flags, maybe even an arena tour. But, you know, what is really interesting is, think of your colleagues in hospital. If the arrest bleep goes off in the hospital, none of your senior staff move. We send the most junior people to the sickest person in the hospital. But I'm shocked. My colleagues just aren't interested in cardiac arrest. They all die. It's boring. It's not interesting. So we've got to make resuscitation great again. We've got to get people enthused about it. So how are we going to do it? Well, let's take some lessons from others. Japanese, elite sport, and Buzz Lightyear. And a lot of this you will already be familiar with. Kaizen basically means change good. And it's a 70-year-old Japanese philosophy of the idea that small, consistent, reproducible changes will ultimately drive to improvement. The first organizations to adopt this are like Toyota and some of the big car manufacturers. And they were able to make cars much more quickly, but also with a much higher level of quality. We can embrace that. We can embrace Kaizen. If you want to give it something different, you've all heard of marginal gains. David Brailsford. So David Brailsford brought this to the Sky team and the British Olympic cycling team. And they looked at the bikes, they looked at the clothes they wear, they looked at their physical training. It's all pretty obvious. But he also looked at the pillows they sleep on and all sorts of other things that you wouldn't even dream of were anything to do with cycling. And all this added up to a consistent and steady improvement. Optimal performance. This is what we need to be trying to do in cardiac arrest. Are you really, at this level, an Olympian in resuscitation? Because you need to be, because if we aren't, we can forget everybody else. The BLS team have done an amazing job, and then we let them down, because we just do vanilla average. If we were to look at marginal gains at their best, look at a Formula One pit crew. This is a resource pit, a pit stop used to take a couple of minutes. Then they got it down under a minute. Then it came down under 30 seconds, under 10 seconds. Now it's under three seconds. They broke down a process that wasn't hugely complex, a bit like resource, but they drilled it down because it was under enormous pressure. And they had to break down each individual element, simplify it, practice it, and then deliver it. And they achieved that. But I think we need to go further than that. 
Mastery is something we normally consider chess grandmasters, Cirque du Soleil performers, or if we look to cultural things, samurai warriors, Chinese and Japanese tea ceremonies. This is where the tiniest little detail is so important to achieve the overall objective. We need to be exactly the same in resuscitation. We need to be true masters. So how are we going to get to that? Well, back in 1993, Ericsson produced his paper. And his idea that was when we run the simulation and when we do things, it needs to be what's called deliberate practice. It needs to be focused. And this led to a number of publications, and many of you have read. We've got Matthew Said and Bounce. And he looked particularly at some of the psychological and environmental factors that lead to expertise. Uh, wh what is your motivation? What is your drive? At what age did you start learning this skill? And he gave with, came up with the idea that you can quantify the practice into 10,000 hours. But then we've got outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, and he took things further. He said this is an oversimplification. Just 10,000 hours is not enough. That 10,000 hours, your practice needs to be focused and deliberate. So when we're doing resuscitation, what sort of things can we focus on? Well, in simple terms, first of all, have we, have we got the full story? Have we looked at the ECG before we arrested? What, what was going on? If we've had a short period of ROSC, what was going on at that time? We may be using echo. We may be using ultrasound. We may, let's get an arterial line. We've heard yesterday, pulse check is completely useless. Why are we still doing it? So let's get an arterial line in. And once we've got an arterial line in, we can also start to do other things. We can put a sheath in the artery. We can thread up a Reboa catheter. We can start to do other things, which may well take us forward to the next level of, of successful resource. And blood gases. I drive my nurses mad, because every couple of minutes, another gas. Let's do another gas. Let's do another gas. Where are we? Where is the physiology of this patient now? And we, should, we know we can do it at the roadside. We know we can do it in the recess room. But how often are you doing a gas at your cardiac arrest? Do you really know what's going on with the biochemistry and the acid base of this patient? Yeah, bicarb might be a dirty word, but, but not if your pH is 6.9, 6.7 you're not going to get this heart going again because it's cardioplegic. We need to think about what is going on biochemistry. And similarly, once we put the, the, the mechanical CPR device on, moving the cup on a mechanical CPR, one centimeter could give me a 20 millimeters of mercury difference in blood pressure. That is incredible. How often do you move the cup? We tend to just look at where it is on the chest. But how about looking at what's going on with the arterial line? How about looking at what's going on with the end tidal CO2? And that will give us a far better indication of whether the cup is in the right place. And all of these organizations were all poor performers. You know these as world leaders in everything they do, individuals, even countries. But now they are world leaders in what they do. How did they get there? Well, part of it, they did embrace marginal gains. But they did other things. They embraced technology. Pixar is another organization that back in 1979 was a tiny little computer, computer graphics organization. But then Lassiter and Jobs came along, and they just said, we need to do more than this. What did they do? How did they turn that into the world's leading animation company that makes amazing films? Well, what they did was they, all, they looked at marginal gains. Yes, what is our objective? Storytelling. How can we improve how we do that graphically? But the other big thing that they did was, what cutting-edge technology is out there? And the final thing they did was to gather audits and feedback of everything that they're doing. We've got audits and feedback. We've got some fantastic alliances. We've got ILCOR and the Research Council alliances looking at the best evidence and trials and guiding us. We've got Utstein that does the audit and publishes a, a regular audit and summary of all of the data that has been gathered. So we've got one alliance, we've got a second alliance. Where's the educational alliance? Where is the group that is going to guide us in how to teach people? I think that's us. We need to become the educational alliance, which doesn't exist at the moment. We need to think, how are we going to embrace the cutting-edge technology like Pixel, Pixar did? 1,500 papers on an average 12 months published on resuscitation. How as an individual are you ever going to keep up with that? This is, but when we're training, this needs to be at our fingertips too. We need to have this. We need to have our laptops out. We need to be online. When the question comes up, well, 
what should we do? What's the, how do you do your dual sequential again? What's the latest evidence? Is it bang, bang, or is it bang? We need to, this needs to be out of our fingertips when we train. So we need to think how we do that. No one has a laptop out on an ALS course. So how are we going to do it? Well, this is a concept described by Keith Sawyer, where we use group genius. If you look at most leading, world leading innovations and groundbreaking innovations, you might imagine that it's someone like da Vinci that comes up with something by himself, an incredible, crazy idea. But the vast majority is when there's been some kind of collaborative creativity, a group of enthusiastic, hugely passionate and intelligent individuals come together and come up with something completely new. And that's what I think we need to be doing. We also need to learn about new techniques. So if you want to go and learn how to use Reboa, where do you go? Well, we need something that will signpost us to all these different courses that are out there, because there's some amazing ones. So what Anderson and I would like to propose to all of you is something we've mentioned a few times already, is Resuscitator. It's not just a course. It's a way of you teaching your colleagues. We don't have to give you a course. You do it yourselves. You are going to go away back to your teams and run resuscitators. And we would then hear, love to hear from you about how it's gone and how it's worked. Because through all of this, we need to gather all the information. We need to try and work our way through the maze of all the options that are out there. So let's give you a way of doing it. This is what we did in the workshop last night. In the round, it's a way of teaching or, or engaging the public that has existed for, for thousands of years. We can go back to before Christ, and the Greeks and the Romans got in the amphitheater. Medieval times used to run pageants in a round circle. We all used to sit around the campfire and tell stories, all in the round. And then the operating theater, where you come and watch a performance, and you learn, and you teach, you gather around. And we can do the same in, in running training beyond ALS. In Resuscitator, we sit in the round. There's a simulation runs in the middle, much like the Shakespearean theatres of old. And this is how we sit in. They said we ran the workshop last night. The space was difficult and it was quite noisy, but it still worked. We got enthusiastic, passionate people, our team, around the simulation. We got some of the team involved in the simulation, and we would practice things, and we'd improve our pit crew and improve our performance. And then we would take a time out, and we'd explore something. Who wants to give adrenaline? What's the evidence? The team are online. Everyone's got their laptop, their phone. Anybody got any evidence? Anyone found a paper? Real time. We're here now looking up papers. We've got someone in the corner on AI. Someone to say, what does AI think about this? And it's a facilitated interactive discussion. And by the time we'd run through the whole sim, this on this side is a whiteboard. It can be an e-whiteboard that captures everything for you. By the end of the session, this one was just on VF. We can do one on asystole. We can do one on post-ROSC. We've got a huge amount of information gathered on the board. The distance we covered last night in an hour was absolutely phenomenal. And if you'd seen the board afterwards, the whole team has been involved in that interaction. As we complete the whiteboard, we have an arrest on one side. We have ROSC on the other. And we gradually move across it populating. And the lines may be the basis of the length of the evidence. We have all sorts of different ways of doing this. We also flag up courses for each of the individual steps that will ultimately help us signpost people. What Resuscitator is, as I say, it isn't just the course. It's a facilitated discussion with your colleagues. And say, you don't need me or a tax to give you a course. You can go home and do this on Monday morning. Gather your team and have a conversation about how you can optimize your performance how you can engage some of the new techniques, which ones do you believe in, which ones do you think are wrong, which one is right for this patient, and how do we decide it's the right one based on the physiological monitoring we're doing. As a team, you take yourselves beyond ALS.